Welcome back to Inside Horror. I'm your host, Elric Kane. And tonight we have a really great show. We have our first ever horror panel, which is something we've been working towards for a very long time uh, to bring you. We also will have a few minutes first with one of the, to me, the master of the short shock, which I'm uh, now dubbing him. Drew Daywalt will be joining us, and Tammy Sutton, and as well, Matthew Curry Holmes. So we'll be introducing them in a second. First joining me, as always, is Miss Stacey Lane Wilson. Hi, hello, everybody. And uh, I have you to thank for this great Twin Peaks shirt. Yes, indeed. That is my taste and your taste meshing beautifully yeah. on your body. I love it. And if it. you can name the gum that will come back into style, <laughs> oh, you goodness. will get a special prize. Oh, oh, what was that gum? The uh, Tutti Free. Oh, no. <laughs> I was thinking of one, but I can't say it on the air. It's a little we, too we naughty, that one enough, I'm talking so about. We really don't have long enough to go <laughs> it's like, on the air. Oh, Freshen Up. That was it. That could be its own show. <laughs> um, and joining us in the corner pocket uh, from Fangoria, Rebecca McKendry. Greetings, horror fans. How can they join this conversation? You can totally join us online by heading to Facebook. We're under Inside Horror. You can also find us on Twitter, also under Inside Horror. Or you can join our live chat by going to the stream.tv slash live. And I am right there reading all the comments right now. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. They've got me wired into everything. So um, pop on, talk to me. We're here. And usually we spend a little more time at the top of the show talking about our favorite films, but we really want to get these three people on air. So we're going to jump right into the Fango feed with you right now, Becca. Yes. So some exciting stuff going on in news this week. First up, Chernobyl Diaries kind of bombed, for lack of a better word. Um, it got nuked by Men in Black 3. <laughs> um, this is Oren Pele, who is also known as the found footage king. He's known for Paranormal Activity 1, 2, and 3 and The River. It closed in fifth place with just a take of eight, under $8 million. So um, not so good of news for Chernobyl Diaries this week. Also in news this week, The Exorcist. I told you last week that it's going to be a play. We now find out it's also going to be a TV show. A TV show. Um, it's being directed by uh, director Sean Darkin, who is known for Martha Marcy May Marlene. Faster. I, I yeah, practiced faster. ahead of time saying that on air. <laughs> Um, and so it's the guy who did that. It's being backed by Morgan Creek, and it looks like it's being slated for 10 episodes. Supposedly, the show is supposed to focus more on what happened before the possession and what happens after the exorcism, so much more of an exploration of the family than of just the possession itself. So, we'll And see. I heard that William Peter Blatty commented that he has not heard anything about the rights of this, and that as far as he's concerned, they're not making anything to do with his book. So it's one of those bizarre stories. I don't know what's yeah, going to come out. So we, we really don't know what's going on with it, but we'll keep you posted. But there has been some kind of off-the-record um, comments going back and forth about who actually owns the rights mm -hmm. and if they actually are uh, allowed to make this. So we'll see what happens mm -hmm. with it. Um, Hatchet 3 has also begun casting. Um, it starts shooting in just a few weeks, and we're just now starting to get some trickles of kind of the new cast who's involved. Um, this one's going to be directed by B.J. McDonnell, who was previously the Steadicam operator. He's actually a very well-established Steadicam operator in the horror industry. And um, he'd worked with Adam Green on the previous Hatchet films, and he's going to be helming this one with Green's blessing. It starts shooting in New Orleans in just a few weeks. Derek Mears has been brought in to play one of the SWAT team members. You'll probably remember him is playing Jason Voorhees before and it will kind of be Jason against Jason because he's going to be battling Victor Crowley who's played by Kane Hodder also a prior Jason we've also got word that Zach Gowan who's previously a WWE wrestler he's best known because he's missing a leg he's an amputee he's also a stunt man and so he's going to be doing stunts on the film so um, we do know that Daniel Harris is also coming back as well as multiple other cast members so we'll let you know about that as news comes in but they should start rolling in just a few weeks on that also, and this was kind of the big one for me today, we've got some news on the bunny game. We've got a new teaser and posters that have been put up online this week. Now, the bunny game has gained a lot of notoriety over the past few weeks simply because it was rejected by the BBC, which essentially means it's now been banned in Britain. And anytime something gets banned, that immediately launches a huge media frenzy about having to see it. I got to check it out this afternoon. Um, but anyways, it's being released stateside through Autonomy Pictures, so it has not yet been banned in the U.S. They are going to be doing a limited theatrical showing early this summer, and then they're supposedly going to be doing a DVD Blu-ray release on July 17th. This film is kind of the day-to-day -day life of a hooker, um, where it, it's kind of a two-part, where it starts out as kind of her day-to-day -day life, 
And it's just horrible, just riddled with like, you know, brutal sex and drugs. And then she gets kidnapped and it shifts over to the kidnap and becomes kind of the ultra torture porn. Um, so fans online have been comparing it to base moi. I would not compare it to base moi, but um, I will respect their opinion and say if you, you want to compare it to something, check out base moi. Isn't this the one, uh, isn't part of the controversy because the actress who also wrote the story actually let herself be tortured for the film? Like she allowed them to torture her and cut her and cut her hair and stuff, is that right? That is what the filmmakers are saying in all of their media reports. Not only did she allow herself to be tortured for the film and all of the torture and everything that you're seeing is 100% real, it's also being said that she herself was previously a prostitute and that much of the film is based off her actual experiences. She does have a writing credit on this and is reportedly one of the main um, backings behind the script and was the main influence of it. So, you know, maybe it, just it takes makes for good acting. Watching someone really be tortured takes all the fun, you know? It's uh, escapist. It's, you know? Yeah, I agree. I know, that's yeah. a turn off. But, um, well, thanks, Becca. Is that our news good? That is our news our for news this week. Covered. Okay, so we're going to keep moseying along. Uh, our first guest, as I said, uh, is my master of the short shock. Uh, he uh, started uh, online videos under Drew Fear Factor, uh, Daywalt Fear Factor, I believe. Uh, and we're going to take a quick look at one of his clips from Camera Obscure, which is actually a web series that he created, and there's some incredible characters and creatures in there. So take a look at that, and then we'll be sitting with Drew. Welcome to the show, Drew Daywalt. Thank hey, you very much. Hey, Drew. Uh, you know, I guess the first sort of obvious question is, uh, how did this short film change your life? Is that how you started with shorts? Or? No, actually, I was a studio screenwriter. <clears throat> and during the strike 2007, 2007 to 2008, when we were all unemployed drastically, mm -hmm. um, I, was, I had 11 movies in various states of not getting made at the studios because I was a script doctor and... I'd written for uh, Tony Scott, Quentin Tarantino, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, Brett Ratner, big action movies. A lot of the kind that you've, you're at Man's Chinese Theater on opening night, you see the trailer and there's guys walking in slow motion out of flames right. mm -hmm. and you go. You write that? You write the slow motion? <laughs> I did. I wrote slow motion yeah. guys coming <laughs> wow. out of flames. Uh, I also did some buddy comedy movies uh -huh. um, and I wrote for Disney. Uh -huh. uh, Disney cartoons. I did a lot of like Timon and Pumbaa and Buzz Lightyear and uh, Woody Woodpecker for Universal. Um, and during the strike, we all had a lot of downtime, and it was simultaneous to the birth of really positive uh, broadband. So you could actually start putting things on YouTube, and they wouldn't ah. be chopped up into little teeny pieces um, while there was loading going on. And I, I, I did some soul searching during that time, and I thought, you know, <clears throat> why am I making movies? I've got 11 movies, you know, that have been written for very big action stars not getting made. Mm -hmm. And while it was satisfying on the one hand, you know, you get steady work, uh, it was very frustrating creatively. I thought, well, I didn't get into this for the money. There's better places to go for money than Hollywood. <laughs> um, and I, and I, I hearken back to my childhood where I was <clears throat> six years old watching movies with my older brothers. Friday night, mom and dad had to work. The, my older brothers babysat, so they were like, let's watch scary movies mm -hmm. tonight. So, uh, we also lived in one of the most notoriously haunted houses in Ohio, um, which is a whole other... Wow, episode. that's yeah. a whole other show. Yeah, that yeah, sounds fantastic. Yeah, and there were some creepy things going on. But, you know, it was, you know, my brother, who was, you know, he was a hippie, and he was, <clears throat> he was into Heavy Metal Magazine and uh, Creepy and Eerie Magazine, and Friday Night was the Friday Night Horror host with some 
cheesy Jack Arnold film from the 1950s, you know, Lobster Man and Them <laughs> and, you know, Attack of the 50-Foot Woman and all that, you know, the blob, mm -hmm. um, mixed in with some of the old James Whale stuff from Universal. And so I didn't know it, but by the age of eight, I had a film education in horror. Um, and I thought, I want to make movies. Star Wars comes around, like everybody else in my generation, we all said, that's what we want to do. We want to go make Star Wars. <clears throat> and then, as it is when you get to Hollywood, you follow your breaks. Something lays in front of you, you take it. It pays the bills, and you know you work forward. Um, and I ended up writing, you know, dialogue that was pleasing to these guys. It was like bickering and bitching, and you know, the Joss Whedon sort of everybody's pissed at each other, but they love each other. You know, the banter. So that's where I ended up. Script that's something doctoring. we know nothing about, by the way. <laughs> yeah, <Better> banter, <laughs> not us. Um, so yeah, so I, I did that, and then what I realized, I want to make monster movies, and I saw my guy, my, my friends who were in horror or in low-budget filmmaking getting their movies made. And I thought, well, you know what? They don't have the budgets that we had, and they don't have the, the SS star power, but they also don't have all that overhead in the studio. And I thought, you know, I want to make monster movies. Um, and I went back to my really nerdy teenage years, and uh, <clears throat> that was all about, for me, I wasn't the comic book nerd. I was the Dungeons & Dragons nerd. Um, so when I saw Peter Jackson and Guillermo del Toro pulling out, you know, playing their cards, I was like, I know their playbook. You know, they're playing from Dungeons and Dragons. They're hmm. playing from Tolkien. Um, so I thought, I want to be part of that. I want to build worlds. And building worlds is not, you know, the next big action film. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to create new things. And um, what, what ended up happening is I was able to go to the Internet, go directly to the fans. I found a creature fabricator named Jeff Farley who's phenomenal in the physical effects world. He's done his resumes as long as my leg on IMDb. Um, he wanted to get involved with me, and we started creating creatures and creating worlds, and we wanted to define worlds. And it didn't take a lot of money, you know, because we went to the, um, the Gene Roddenberry School or the Rod Serling School where the Twilight Zone had enough money for a gray room and a, a crappy couch. <laughs> right. Go. Right. So it was all about story, all about character. Um, so sort of, you know, all the bad effects in the early Star, uh, Star Treks, no one cares. You know, you watch the Gorn episode, and he's fighting a big, you know, plaster uh, lizard man, and no one cared because the story was good, you know? But what about creating, like, you're creating, like, they're like mini features in a way, and that's how they feel. I think that's why they're effective, and you create that tension in such a short amount of time where some features don't ever master that. How do you go about creating tension in such a short space? Well, you know, it's interesting. The, the, I think that part of the reason I got into this was someone said, you're not going to be able to scare somebody on YouTube. Come on. Um, and they're like, it's three minutes tops. You're not going to scare them in three minutes. And I started scouring movies that I liked. And one of them is uh, Shirley Jackson's The Haunting. I think it's 1963. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, that movie was pivotal for me because there is a shot in that film where it's a 45 second shot of a doorknob. Right when the girls trapped yeah, that's in the, the girls trapped in the room, shot, all sound uh -huh. design, yeah. all sound design, and there's some rubber on the walls, yeah. but mm -hmm. but you got one girl who's the the sort of sadistic psychic in the bed, and you got the girl who thinks she's going mad, and you're you know you're in her voice throughout the whole film, and they're looking at the door, and it's doorknob, them freaking out, doorknob, them freaking <laughs> out. It's 45 seconds long, and wow. it's, I'm thinking to myself, okay, that's that's how we do it. Right. Um, it's you don't try and it's funny you say master of shock. Uh, the short shock mm -hmm. when it's actually the master of I'm uh, not a master. It's the uh, it's <laughs> Wait, he's gonna redefine no, 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 no. No. I, I don't work in shock, I work yeah. in dread. Right. Okay. Yeah. Dread because you can actually get a lot of dread in three minutes. And it's distilling that the three minutes that would terrify you in a ninety minute movie right. all done at once, starting with some interesting setup that pulls you in and makes you sympathetic to the character. Right. Right. And they're not all shocking either. That, that's just my I'm just trying to sell you like William Castle. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a skeleton that just comes yeah, out on a wire. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so you know that was that was the idea. Was you know you come into it and you 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 use that you use that short time instead of fighting the short time because I saw guys doing it with comedy and since horror to me has always been the flip side of comedy. It really is. You're going down the street. I promise you, we're going to make a left turn. Bang, right turn. Right. That's the laugh. Horror is the same way. You just you make the turn and. It, it's shocking or terrifying. Well, you talked about um, seeing so many horror films as a child, and there does seem to be sort of a, I don't want to say a preoccupation or an obsession, but there's a, a running theme in your films with uh, childhood fears. What is it that keeps you wanting to explore that? You know, that's two, there's two parts to that. 
Um, I, had a, I, had, I had great parents. Uh, I, had, I was the youngest of six, so there was no shortage of people trying to scare the shit out of me as a kid. <laughs> right. um, and we lived in a very large spooky house. It was, well, yeah. it was the town haunted house when my parents bought it in 1960 before I was born. And everyone said, don't buy the house. It's been empty for a generation, for a reason. Mm. Um, but they had six kids. Mom was a nurse. Dad was a fireman. They needed some cheap place, and it was really cheap because it was a murder house, and it was a you know it was a stagecoach stop. It dated back to 1840, um, and it had servants' quarters and back bedrooms, and they they fixed it up you know for the family, and uh, we moved in, and there were constantly sounds and creaks and strange things. And in the basement, actually, we had a well like you'd see like a well in a small village in a medieval town, like with uh -huh. the bricks and the thing and the crank with the thing. There was one of those in our basement. Oh, wow. Yeah, they had that in Toolbox Murders. Remember that? <laughs> there you go. You lived in the there you go. I did. Well, I saw the ring, and I just about died. Because right. that, very, that very well was in our basement. So I had a very um, active imagination, because my brothers were feeding it with eerie and creepy. And my right. brother was an art major, so he was bringing home big uh, triptychs of uh, Hieronymus Bosch and Dolly and oh, wow. uh, Goya and all these insane amounts of dark art, because that's mm -hmm. what he did. Right. Um, Combined with all the comic books laying around the house, combined with the fact that it was probably a haunted house. Right. I don't. I'm a little agnostic on the haunted thing, but you know. Um, I wonder what it is now. All these years later. Yeah, you know, uh, a friend of mine recently visited them, and they've had nothing. I think my family is just weirdos. We brought it out. <laughs> Maybe know. that's it. But um, but it's a combination of that, and then the second part is, I like to explore what terrifies me the most, and um, surprisingly, I'm a, a fairly well-adjusted dad now. And uh, the thing that scares me the most is, you know, danger or loss of children. Mm. Right. Don't so, look now. I can't yeah. watch that now. Yeah, it, used yeah. To, it used to be probably my favorite horror film. And now can't I'm go there. too scared to can't probably watch it. Can't go there, yeah. And it's the thing that but you still like the, the child beheading in Piranha 3 Double D. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't my child. I, that child deserved it. There's a difference. There really is a brat. Yeah. Come on, you know. Exactly. It was a ginger. It was a ginger. <laughs> ginger. So, There's a like, big oh, strike sorry. against no. him right there. Okay. Sorry, I've got two of them on the show. <laughs> go with you know. Yeah. Uh, so that's what it is. You know, right. I, I really feel, you know, I saw David Cronenberg, or I heard him on NPR once, and they, and they said, you know, you seem so normal, and how can you go right. to these such creepy, dark places? And he says, well... I chronicle my nightmares. Right. Most people try to forget it when they wake up. And I, I not only write it down, I embrace it, I memorize it, and then I film it. That's how he gets films like The Brood and right. um, you know, everything else he's done, Scanners. Um, all that body horror that he did mm -hmm. was nightmares that he was having about mm. venereal disease. He would have a recurring nightmare about that stuff. So anyway, taking it to a personal place, right. the worst thing that can happen to a parent is loss of a child. Um, Lars Van Trier's Antichrist just mm. yeah. about mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. killed me. Yeah. Um, so I combine my fears of walking down the dark hallway toward the empty door, you know, with my own fears of, of loss of, of my children. So, and, and, and that's something that's not going to go away, so you'll always have that well to drop yeah, into. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we want to obviously get the rest of the panel out in a second. Uh, you've recently, people should check out Old Chair. The Old Chair with A.J. Bowen, a favorite yes. actor, a friend mm -hmm. of our show. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that's on YouTube right now, right? Yes, it is. Which is where a lot of all the shorts are. And do you have any, are you looking at making a feature in that same vein, like independently? Or? Yeah, actually with A.J. Um, oh, but we are, we are working, you know, it's, we're, every, like everybody else in town, we're raising money. So who knows mm -hmm. when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen. But um, A.J. and I are looking at a haunted house film. It's about a uh, 911 operator who has a haunted 911 call. Cool. Ooh, That's all cool. I can talk about right now. About yeah, cool. Me and AJ. And we'll bring up Black Box TV once one of our other guests here, because you guys both did something. We can talk about that as we get them out. Sure. So, cool. And really oh. quick, before we jump yeah. from um, Drew's childlike films, um, Mile 13 says that the Easter Bunny is eating my candy is like a holiday tradition in his household now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it was, was one of the first films that we made, actually. And... Uh, the hardest part about filming that was getting my three-year-old daughter to walk a straight line. I needed to get a shot of her feet walking down a hallway, and she was ah, like, nice. she, she turned around halfway and go, "Daddy, is this good?" Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So that was it was actually fun for our family to make. I'm yeah, it was hard to pull clips for this because I didn't want to give away the scares, and you know, things like bedfellows are hard not to give away. We're probably giving it away behind us, but that's it's, a, it's a walking spoiler. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is a walking. They all are. So, uh, so our next guest made this great gritty gangster film called Isle of Dogs, but has also worked in every facet, not just of the genre, but in filmmaking and now she's writing and directing her own films. Uh, I believe her next film in post at the moment is Whispers, which mm -hmm. is a supernatural film, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to have a quick look at Isle of Dogs, and then Tammy Seven will join us. Good old love. This is my town. All the villains in it belong to me. 
I've got a tough job, but I admit it, I love my work. You could say I've got everything I ever wanted. Unfortunately, things don't always work out the way you plan. You're acquainted with me, why finish your son? The man in my position, I don't need to share the merchandise, do I? Taking people out of the equation, that's my game. You look pathetic. We are back <laughs> with Tammy's Tammy here. Sutton. Wow, Tammy. <laughs> hello. So, hello. So, Whispers is in uh, post now. Is that correct? Yes, my second film shot in London and actually Devon, out in the countryside in England. Whispers, which, funny enough, is very, I mean, it's not funny, but it is definitely a loss. A mother loses her child, and we don't know if she's being haunted or wow. tortured or emotionally falling apart. And and all in the same, so it was a very emotional film to make. I and suppose Isle of Dogs was very emotional and very violent, and this one's a much different sense in the horror genre. Um, and is the mother Barbara? No, okay. actually Barbara Nettlejakova from. Didn't want to say her from, last no, name. No, Barbara. Yeah, Net, you didn't want to say her name. <laughs> Barbara Nettlejakova from Hostel, who is in Stars and Isle of Dogs, is in. Whispers, but our lead is Keely Hazel, okay. who I did not realize how many American gentlemen knew who she was because she's hmm. a famous FHM model. But she's an amazing actress. I auditioned her at Universal, and she was just the one. Because I think Barbara's the most beautiful woman on the face of the earth. Oh, I'll make sure I told she, her hears she was here. <laughs> I was like, we had a lot of pretty girls that night, and she, um, I remember she every time she spoke, I was kind of like, blah, blah, Barbara's blah, blah, blah. lovely. Yeah. <laughs> she's yeah. lovely. She has really nice films. And she will, she this. will continue yeah. to be in my film. Yeah. She's also a great friend and, and, a, and a, a great lady, so I'm okay. very happy for her. Cool. So we got one more person. Yes, we do. And we'll rounding out our panel is uh, someone who's been in sequels and remakes, which are going to be a couple of topics of discussion. And he's also prepping his highly original Psych 5, which he's going to be uh, writing, directing, a uh, little bit of everything he'll tell us about it. Matthew Curie Holmes, come on in. So we've got a quick clip of his. Yeah. Okay, you said. Right? I love that extra <laughs> teaser. Wow. Talk about three double D. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A bit of weight. Uh, yeah, you, we've got you strapped down there, wrapped like a mummy. <laughs> yes. So we're, we'll, have, we'll have time to talk about it, uh, more individual right. projects, but let's get into it. We've got a panel, so let's make the most let's of do it. it. Uh, okay, I'm going to kick off with my hot, hot button. If you watch the show every week, I pretty much complain about found footage like an old codger. So I'm going to ask you uh, the, the trend now, not just found footage, but turning everything into found footage. Frankenstein's being reimagined, Carrie's being reimagined as found footage. Uh, everyone complains about them. The audiences are always complaining about them, and yet they're making truckloads of them. Carrie is found footage? They're, they're talking about making a portion of it, or the whole thing. Excerpt. So what I'm getting at is, okay, so people are complaining. Audiences seem to be dissatisfied in a way, but why do they keep getting made? Why are we continually making them and going to these? 
Well, I, I, it's easy. It's a cheap way to make a movie. Right. I mean, if you have a subjective uh, POV and you're following one, uh, ostensibly following one person around, I mean, with minimal cuts, then, you know, you you can, you can make, uh, you know, a movie under $250,000. I think what people are complaining about is the fact that most of the found footage movies suck because the stories are bad. Right. The gimmick is... Because they're using it as a gimmick before well, it, the story. It, look, it, the script is paramount. I mean, right. it doesn't matter if you're making a found footage, if you're making an epic blockbuster. Like, if your script is not great, your movie's going to suck. I don't care what director you are. Um, you know, but what do the audiences like about them then? So, like, well, I mean, obviously something initially drew us to these films. What know, is it? They seem to be born, um, other than Blair Witch... Right. They seem to be born after the internet vlog appeared, at least from what I can see. And reality TV. And reality TV. Right. But, the, but the vlog where they're looking right in the camera, right. and it's like, you know, oh, I'm feeling bad about my mommy today. And, right. You know, it's like, so people got used to someone talking mm -hmm. into the camera. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that, I think, birthed, you know, paranormal activity, which is really the spark that started all of this. That's where the, the image is. Yeah. Blair Witch didn't really actually spark a great deal at that And point. it no. seems to be its own genre. I mean, it's not right. necessarily restricted to horror, because right. we were just talking uh, off air about Chronicle, which I actually liked quite a uh -huh. bit. Um, I loved as well. Cloverfield, which is a yeah, big Cloverfield, movie, I thought was know. great. So, and Rec, it was, I mean, Rec oh. was, to me, the strongest of the actual horror. Yes. We're using it for Well, what about and the Cannibal Holocaust? Right, I mean, which did it. It's not, like, it's, right. it's not like this is a new thing, you know. Right. I mean, they've been. They've but this is the first time they've been using everyone's using it as the style to make another film. Like it's like literally, I've got this great idea for a script. Hey, if you turn that into found footage, we can green light it. Yeah, that's pretty. Well, that's, what's hap that's what's <laughs> yeah. happening. Beyond, I mean, obviously, most important thing yeah. we need is great scripts. We agree. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, right. behind Fair the enough. scenes, in front of the camera. I'm not gonna lie. You get in that room with your money people, and they see the money going towards. These found, these you know, fake found footage movies, and it's a very easy, tempting carrot for mm -hmm. filmmakers to, to get into, especially new filmmakers. They want to get in that, you know, the money making bandwagon. They want to get a job. They want to get their film made. I know that there's filmmakers out there right now, and people thinking about writing films that are absolutely going. I've got this great idea, but. I'm just going to turn it into a found footage movie because that's what's the, that's the trend right now. Right. Unfortunately, that's a big I, piece of it. Yeah, I know. Uh, there's a couple filmmaker uh, friends of mine who are actually uh, they're they're not even saying I'm going to turn it into found footage. They're like, I'm making a found footage right. film. I don't think that the gimmick. I mean, we we call it a gimmick and stuff. I understand from a produ producing standpoint because you're literally taking a ten million dollar movie and making it for forty thousand dollars. Like that is just right. appealing, right? Because who can't sell a forty thousand dollar film, right? But the yeah. very definition of the of the found footage film for me, one of my problems is we already know the outcome. The fact that you called it a found footage film meant that everyone dies, and for me that eliminates half of the interest of a horror film, which is survival. Mm -hmm. It really does instantly. As soon as somebody goes, "Hey, it's found footage," okay, well, well then great. there's your next, you know? then there's your next found footage right. film. Is Twist like it where you basically just have the guy you pull back from the editing bay and go, "Hey, look what we made!" Right. And wow, everyone lived. But could, and does it also signal like the? <laughs> I mean, my, my biggest concern is that it signals uh, a loss of craft that directors like Polanski and Cronenberg knew how to craft the same kind of suspense through shots and performance. And now it feels like it's all restrictive POV, which is the easiest way to scare someone because you can't see mm -hmm. anywhere else. Like, ah, it's boogeyman. It's you like know? 3D in the 50s. You know, I think it's a phase. I think we're going to get, we're going to, we're going to get our, we're going to find our way through it. Um, kind of like 3D now. We're going to find our way through it. You know, and I, I think there was a, there was, there was a great, there was, yeah, there was a great book, and I can't remember if it's called Francois Truffaut on Hitchcock or Hitchcock. Yeah, it's Hitchcock on Truffaut. Truffaut. It's just Hitchcock book. Truffaut. Truffaut. Yeah, yeah. Um, where they talked about, you know, Hitchcock talked about you know, the slow moving camera and the dolly and the importance of the meaning of the shot and how the flow and how a movie was cursive to him. Right. And when he, and he would all, it was, you know, punctuation and curves and, you know, it had a feel. The movie had a feel in his mind visually. Right. And Truffaut, if you've seen any of his work other than 400 Blows, it looks like um, it's 1950s found footage almost. It just looks home movie and it looks mm -hmm. cheap and shitty. And I believe you called it Verite at the time. It is Verite. Well, you know what? They invented, well, they invented the auteur thing right. because they said, you know, we don't know how to make movies. We are a bunch of film critics. You know, him and Godard and all his, right. his cronies over in France yep. were like, they were, they were you critics. You just called call Claude Chabrol a crony. Wow. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Super Claude Chabrol. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, you know, so they, so they... You know, they were dealing with, we don't know how to work camera, right. but we're, we, we know how to tell a story. Right. So we're going to sacrifice all this technical skill that guys like Hitchcock had so that we can 
at least get the story out there. And they were good storytellers. Yeah. But the movies, you know, they don't look so great. You know, right. it's uh, you know. But even a bad-looking film, horror or not, if and, and I know I'm going back to the script, but even a bad-looking horror film, if your if your story's good, you're going to forgive a lot. Yes. Like you can always look at if it's a low-budget film, you, you you know, you make a, a small-budget movie that's really well written, it'll be like. The, the the audience will go, oh, it's too bad they didn't have the money to do this. But right. if you have a terrible, shitty script and it looks bad, like you're done. Right. Like your movie just sucks. Twilight right. Zone is a perfect example. You know, he had crap budgets from CBS. Mm -hmm. you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the Rod Serling had horrible budgets every week, but it was all on the story. It was all Richard great Matheson scripts. and Robert right. Block and some of the greatest writers of the right. 20th century um, all putting in. And it literally, you know, some of those episodes were like an office that had three gray walls, one painting of a bad flower, and a desk. And suddenly mm -hmm. you were riveted to what was happening to this human being. And I think that no matter what uh, format it is, I think the sin, the sin, I think we all agree on found footage, is that there are going to be people who break through and do some genius work. They're going to find a really innovative, interesting way. And I've heard, I have not, I, admittedly, I've not seen VHS, but I hear there's some moments of the brilliance in that The first one. story, Bruckner, yeah. uh, from the Signal mm -hmm. Historic, was. Astronomical. It should have been a feature. So in my mind, it. but I other ones are pretty routine. But it's a great film altogether. But mixed in with that are a thousand guys who go, "Oh, I can do this." All right, now you come running at me and then throw right. blood on me, and right. it's like. Oh. That's why we're seeing in the chats right now is we're getting a lot of comments from people who are saying things like it's overdone, I'm sick of seeing them, but we're also getting a lot of comments of people talking about how there's a great aesthetic to it. And when it's done well, it's done really well and it's something you'll remember. A lot of people are talking about quarantine mm -hmm. and Chronicle as being ones, and I would throw in Wreck just because I, I absolutely love Wreck, yeah. um, as being ones that are just you know really well done. It's because they move, they're direct and they're fast. Oh, and we different. all agreed Chronicle was Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I mean, obviously, we started talking before we started rolling. But I have to mention, I have to give an, a, a, a letter grade out. I have to give an A to the Euro Troll Hunters. Ah. Troll yeah. Hunters. I was expecting was it to be low budge, mm -hmm. crazy, and it just was one of those wonderful fantasy surprises and I was like I, I liked it up to a, up to a come point. on about three quarters of the way through I thought it was <laughs> no I, I did I enjoyed it it was a lot of fun but then again the the, the story like it just didn't mm -hmm. right. well it they wrote, resorted it, to the giant monster yeah it had no <laughs> end it See, I love monsters though it was, so the I, devil, I was it was the devil inside you know it's like you've got this thing which which I will be the first to admit I did not loathe it the way my, um, uh -huh. you know, the yeah. director yeah. did. So we're going to now vote yeah, Matthew no, no. off the island. No, no, no. He's I, about I, to be voted off the cat. I will agree the ending was terrible. But it, 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 to my point, and the same Horror with Troll Hunter, is that it just ended. Island. It didn't It didn't have, you know, it, it didn't have the conviction of its, you know, of, uh, of, of what it had for the first hour, right. you know, which if you watch I would actually agree. The Devil yeah. Inside, yeah. I mean, it. You watch the first hour, and you're, just, you're kind of going, okay, where's this going, where's this going? The problem is it didn't go anywhere, so then you're left with, oh, fuck. Yeah, the website. Yeah. Now, I want to change the, the subject tunnel. a little bit here and talk about uh, sequels and remakes, because as a writer for Horror.com, yeah, I know, you don't know anything. Never done for many, many, many years, one of my <laughs> first assignments was to cover the Fog remake, <laughs> which you were in. And, uh, yeah, so I want to get your take, actually, initially on how hard is it to make an original script, because you are working on Psych 5, which yes. is an original story. Yes. It's just Psych. But, it, yeah. Five is... <laughs> the five instead of the S. The five is instead of the S. Ah, being, there are five people in there, though. There Will is, the five yes. survive? Yes. Will they? Can the five survive? <laughs> we don't know. Um, uh, how hard is it to do an original... Um, well... You know, I mean, it's I, I, I think it's easy to, to, to write in a, something original. Just mm -hmm. to get it through mm -hmm. the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm doing it independently. So yeah. for me, it's just about as how much hard work am I willing to put into it? How many hours? How, am I going to put the 10,000 hours in to, to, to make this happen? Absolutely. Right. Um, is it hard to do in a studio? Yeah, we pitched it to studios and everyone just balked and said, unless there's a franchise, unless, like, you know, we got the horror saturated. Uh, unless you have a, uh, a marquee name, or unless you, it's a franchise, do you or have you anything the found footage? Do you have anything <laughs> found footage? No, it's a real yeah, thing. Yeah. You know, and where is the, where's yeah, the yeah. hook? Yeah. And, and I'm like, I'm being meta. And they're like, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> so you know what I what I've I guess not resorted to. And I think what's important now for independent filmmakers, and we're all independent filmmakers, mm -hmm. is that it is now is the time to make your movies. Like. It has never make been. Make the film you want to make now because Ugh. it's changing, especially if you want to get money from 
any kind, if, especially if you're interested in the studio world, it's a whole other. Hmm. Well, the studios yeah. don't care. Like, that's the irony is that you make your movie first, and then the studios will be like, you're a genius. And I'm like, well, where were you when I had the right, little, Well, you know, it's it an actor, Matt, though. I mean, you've done sequels and I remakes. Have. But as filmmakers, all of you have gone the original route pretty yeah. much. I, I, I mean, my first movie was a I want to talk Killjoy about Le Leprechaun, apparently. <laughs> Killjoy <Yeah. too. laughs> We're bringing out the clowns and the leprechauns. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. as an actor, I don't have a choice. I mean, as an, as an actor, it's not like I get to go, uh, you know, choose my movies. I audition for whatever right. I can get and so if it's the fog which by the way when i i lobbied to be in that film because i just wanted to uh -huh. you know, on on paper it's like yeah. dude the remake of the fog right sadly <laughs> not so good right <laughs> lack, lack of control is it i mean have you gone in and had this experience of pitching an original idea and they're just looking for sequels uh, remakes no actually it this takes us right back to the first subject which is can we do it found footage right. really yeah mm -hmm. no actually we can't you can but I, mm. I don't, you know, I, I, there are certain <laughs> I, things that, that lend themselves. But I, I fought it on my new one, Whispers. We're editing right now. Hmm. And the first thought in my head was, how can we go back and CGI this into, no. I mean, I, I had that, like, two glass wine thought. <laughs> right. The next morning, yeah. it was like, yeah. no. Oh, good. Let's, let's make the movie we intended. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we're directors and integrity. writers, and we're looking for work, like the right. actor. You know, the directors always don't have the choice either, because... Um, I was in a situation last year where I was working with After Dark Films on an incredibly dark, abysmally dark, wonderfully dark horror film. It was a haunted house Sounds movie. Great. It was really crazy, and they kept saying, "Go darker, go darker." And it was actually um, with uh, the Sci-Fi Network with with Chiller, uh -huh. and, they, and I, I pitched them in a, what I thought was a studio ending, and they said, "No, no, no, kill everybody." Uh, and right. I went, "Really?" And leave the little girl at the end of the movie right, hopeless in the rain, and the monster could come. And they were like, the "Yeah." Tape. So that was on its way to being made. And After Dark calls me and says, you know, we've got, there's, there's some low-hanging fruit. You've been approved as a, as, a, as a network director for them. It's a leprechaun movie. You can have it now. Right. So you're, you're faced with those choices. Right, you're right. faced with those choices. Mm -hmm. And those are, quite simply, for an independent filmmaker, those are, those are economical choices, right. too. Um, and you hope that you can get through it and make something good. You make the best, you know, sci-fi movie Within you can. The time, and, then, right. and then go back to your incredibly dark, wonderful piece of art that you want that you to do on your own. Okay, but what about Kevin the Woods? Like, do you think, and obviously that hasn't had necessarily the financial impact a lot of us hoped. It had obviously great reviews. Mm -hmm. Do you think that film is going to have any significant effect on the genre? And especially, I know for me, I watched Madison County right after, mm -hmm. and it did the exact effect that you thought it would do. I, I almost found it unwatchable mm -hmm. simply because it had just reminded me about original ideas. <laughs> well, Cabin in the Woods has definitely kneecapped a lot of Cabin movies and a lot right. of films that are of that genre, and I think they meant to. Um, and maybe maybe the, maybe it's time for that nail right. in the coffin. But I, I think I think Cabin in the Woods was a, was was basically a hate letter to uh, to, to to slasher films. Yeah. Not a love mean, letter to. I well, I, I well the reason I call it a hate letter is because it was just so like it was just so well done. Like, yes, it was just yeah. basically saying like we're making the definitive yes. film. Like this is it. I don't even know that they liked those movies, but they claim they loved them. I yeah, mean, I didn't yeah. feel like I just felt like it was a particular formula that they were saying. Okay, we've done it. Let's just let's try something else for a while. Yeah, I didn't feel I was as angry as that, but I, you know, I, I get. Wait, what you mean. Wait, and I'm using the term loosely. Right. It was more like uh, let's let's see how far we can take right. this. And, and but did and anyone it, notice? Was it like? Do you think I mean, we noticed? But do you yeah. think the genre? You know what? I think that they will because I, I remember going to see Big Trouble in Little China, yeah. thinking this is an action movie. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I walked out. I, I won't give away my age, but you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I was 15. So I walk out of the movie going, that sucked. And my friend is like, you're an idiot. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, that was hysterical. I'm like, yeah, it, was. it was the worst action movie I've ever seen. He's like, it wasn't an action movie, <laughs> doofus. Let's go back in. He bought me another ticket. Said, we're watching it again. Watch mm -hmm. it as a comedy. That's I came out, literally saw it twice in one night. And I realized, oh, my God, I, it was meta. It was John Carpenter doing right. to the Hong Kong action movie what these guys, uh, yeah. Drew Goddard, right, just right. did to. Right, just Whedon. Right. Well, and, and just to qualify that a little bit, I don't think that they, like, that they hated the genre. Right. Um, what what I was sort of getting at was that they were saying like, look, you know what? If we're going to do this, let's 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 go there. Let's right. go to that place. And the result to me, I thought it was phenomenal. I saw it twice. I thought, but maybe that anger's warrant. Yeah, maybe it is anger, and maybe that's what made it good. Yeah, you know? they actually put some. It, it wasn't cynical though. You know, I find that a lot right. of the films right. like they can they can be mean and cynical. Mm. This was definitely not. Right. That no, totally. Thing. Totally. I mean, but do you guys know? Sorry, if this was. Their intention, or was it just? Oh yeah, yeah. Was I, it? I, I, I saw them so. talking uh, yeah. after South I, I don't know the guys, and I they said they I love horror. It. And they but you know what? It's three weeks in, and we're still talking about that yeah. movie. That's yeah. a good, no, it's good. sign. It's a good, and it's a great movie. Like yeah. I, 
I took I took my wife to see it, and she loves Joss Whedon but hates horror films, and it was it was amazing to watch with her because she saw it and uh, she's like leaning over to me saying, "Get me the hell out of here! I don't want to see this wow. anymore." Because she just okay. she hates slasher films, especially Hillbilly. And then at the end, I'm sorry. with the third act, which was <laughs> we're not going to give away, I but it was a what comedy. happened? <laughs> oh, I agree. I thought so too. And at the end, and she 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 walked out and, and I said, "Well, what'd you think?" And she goes, um, "It was amazing." I hated it. Like, oh, wow. That's, that's yeah. a like very perfect Don't wow. they should quote her. Sorry, this, Rebecca. Oh, no problem. Don't you guys think that this has kind of been done before? It's kind of cyclical, like it happened before with Scream? You know, kind of the decompacting of the genre, and then everybody saying, oh, it's the death of the slasher film? Just I do. Questioning. I thought Scary Movie was the death of the slasher film, actually. <laughs> like, I did. I thought once once you hit parody, like, you're... Uh, once you hit bad parody. Like, bad parody. Like, you know, yeah, you're... Okay. Then the, once then Leslie the Nielsen film. is one of your characters in a movie, you know? Yeah. yeah that's, that's <laughs> once Leslie Nielsen's... But I, I certainly don't think that um, the found footage films or any anything of the like or anything reality-based, I don't think there is an end to horror genre, because I know we were going to get to that... Tonight. Well, there is an end, actually, to our show. Unfortunately, <laughs> we are on a timetable. But I, I actually... Well, I don't we, think horror's going anywhere. You don't think so? Can't. Yeah, no. <laughs> it can keep changing, and we're it does go staple, cyclical. We're man. It, we're in now. The fans are too loyal. Right. Too many. Just, you know what? Just make good movies. Like, just, I know yeah. it sounds it's, it's so trite, but honestly, no, sit in a room. There's a truth to that. And just write your script. You want to do you know, do-it-yourself horror films? Like, I applaud that. But mm -hmm. don't even set foot onto a set until you've had 40 amazing screenwriters look at your script and say, now you're ready to go. Well, shoot a short before that. You know, get, or, do do something shorter and yeah. you can or no, no, each right. script, each script, he's right. Each script, mm -hmm. don't be. You said it earlier; it was a very important. Important. Don't be precious. Don't be precious. Just Let right. people read your stuff that you care about their opinion and get, take it or leave it. But get some notes. There are people in this room who have read my scripts and given me great notes. And believe me, points taken. It's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're we're basically out of time, but we yeah. don't want to leave without this very quick last. We do a five fast questions at the end. And because we have all three, you're going to have to answer even quicker. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. Down the line. We, you ready? Oh, no. Okay. okay. And we're going to zoom, crash Drew zoom first. Okay. Beth, your first scary movie. The Exorcist. Exorcist. Alien. Very nice. What do you fear? The thing behind the door. Being broke. That there is a God. What is your favorite possession? Uh, the Exorcist. Hmm. Tammy? My cat. My daughter. Oh, you, you possess, possess your daughter? <laughs> totally. That's because she possesses me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, the film you've seen the most times, maybe not necessarily your favorite, but what film have you seen the most? Uh, I'm going to say TV show. I've probably seen the Kolchak series mm. uh, 150 times. It it's like, it's comfort work. food for yeah, me. It is. <laughs> Tam? Oh, I'm not sure. Ugh. A million westerns. Sorry. Oh, Star Wars. 213 times. Okay, this one we've never asked, <laughs> and it's because of you guys, because we were asking about remakes. If you had to remake a horror film, gun to the head, what would it be? Uh, children shouldn't play with dead things. Ah, great choice. Bob Clark. How do I follow that? Really? It's a joke, because I just wrote it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you um, want keep... Attention, sorry, I'm interjecting. Pay attention to Fangoria for news on Drew Daywalt's children shouldn't play with dead things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. If I had to, gun uh -huh. to the head? Gun to the head. 2001. Oh, wow. There you Thanks. go. See, I think you should remake shitty horror I agree and do it right. So <laughs> let's remake Troll 2. I totally agree. No, oh, yeah, I would <laughs> Wait, kill to remake Troll 2. Let two. the directors who were not happy with their early films remake them. Uh, that, George that, Lucas did that. Didn't turn out so well. I don't think well. it's going to improve much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, uh, yeah. All right. Well, we have Horror a lot of things we like get to, but though, we're going to. I hope you know. Hopefully, you guys will be able to join us again when your new films come out. When Psych finally gets made. It was great to talk to you guys. Yeah, it was a really Thanks fun show. And when Psych Five, the sequel comes yeah, the sequel, out, the yeah. fifth. <laughs> when, when Psych uh, Five. I'm going to be directing the parody in about ten years. So <laughs> we're going to be having a. Uh, we won't be on air next week, but then we have two more shows in the season yep. and a couple big ones coming up. So make sure you stay tuned. We still have a couple giveaways that we're going to do on Facebook. Make sure to like the show. Thank you so much to our horror panel. It's been a real blast. Thanks, today. Thank guys. you very much, guys. And Thank go you. rent a Thank found you. footage film. Right. Oh, yes, right now. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. See you next week. Well, done on time. 7.45.